Ross Kemp yra žanro legenda ir mes pabandysim iš jo ištraukti dalykus, kuris niekam dar nėra sakęs. I know it's a stupid question. Uh, no, it's not a stupid question. It's quite an intelligent question. Well, basically, um, I'd acted for a very long time in a popular soap in the UK mm -hmm. and worked continuously, day to day, virtually for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then I got what I wanted, what I thought I wanted, which is a very big contract with ITV, mm -hmm. two main channels really, terrestrial channels, BBC and ITV in the UK. And I found that I was only working six months of the year and the other six months, I was pretty bored. Yeah. And then by, by complete fluke, or accident as we say, mm -hmm. um, somebody asked me to present a documentary about America's love affair with guns. And I come from a military family. Mm -hmm. So I did the job, and while I was doing the job, I met a guy who was in the Bloods, which is an American gang, black gang, mm -hmm. from South Los Angeles. And this guy had been shot 27 times. Yeah, very serious guys. Uh, well, I didn't believe anybody could be shot 27 times and survive mm. until I met this guy and he took his top off and I could see he'd been cut open twice. He'd been shot six times in the chest. While he was on the ground, they'd pulled the trigger here. He'd taken the end of his tongue off, exited here, re-entered here, landed uh, in his forehead. And I, and I thought to myself, what I was seeing, and bear in mind this is 10 years ago, mm. what I was seeing was not what I was witnessing on MTV, which are all these cool guys with guns and lots of gold around their necks and blonde girls bling, and bling. bling bling and lots of blonde girls under their arms. He had a very, very nice but very large black wife. He had two kids on either hips. He had a block toilet. He wasn't rich. Yeah. Um, he had a rusty Mac 10 submachine gun wherever he went in his hand. And down the back of his trousers, he had a Smith & Wesson 38. And more importantly for me, instead of being very arrogant and like, I'm cool, he was actually scared every time a car drove past the entrance or the entrance to his house because he thought it was going to be a drive-by. And so I got on the phone to the people that I knew at Sky. I rang them up and said, I've got an idea for a series about gangs to show them what they're really, not, what they're really like, not the image that we were seeing on television or in the movies. And so I started mo making programs about gangs and then it, it moved on from there. Tell us, uh, brief us uh, shortly about all your uh, opportunities to visit Afghanistan. It was three times, right? Well, it's three series, but we've, we've visited it far more times than just oh, three times. Sorry. Because when you're filming, uh, you pick times or hopefully pick times during the campaign or during, we call them herricks. Every six month tour is known as a herrick. Mm -hmm. And so we'd go out at the beginning of the tour or we'd go out halfway through the tour and towards the end of the tour. We'd also take trips up to Kabul, which is not where the main British forces are based. Yes. Some are, but the main British contingent is down in Helmand, as you probably know. And we'd go and interview the politicians or the Taliban. We met the Taliban in prisons and stuff like that. So we would go out more than three times. I think it's around about 12 times, eight, 12 times now, time, time, 12 times over the uh, over the period of five years that we've been yeah. covering it, yeah. All right. Talking about Taliban uh, people, can you please describe a, a sort of generic uh, man on the hill? I mean, uh, well, well, a, a member of the Taliban? Yes. Well, first of all, he's probably going to be a Pashtun. Um, I think, having, went out, having gone out to Afghanistan in 2007, I think everybody would admit now even the Americans, that we made some fundamental mistakes. And I will come back to answering your question in terms of, of how we approach the people there. Sangin has always been the hotbed, the hardest place to fight. And I don't know if you know, but in the Herricks before we went out there, Herrick six and five, the bombs were virtually, the paras and the marines virtually had to call bombs on their own positions to stop themselves from being overrun. It was like something... Stalingrad. Well, yeah, or from Victorian times when, when, when the Brits were actually overrun and all wiped out, you know? So what we did when we first went out there, I think we made some fundamental mistakes in misunderstanding their culture. We would go into their houses and search through, through their houses and we'd knock the Koran over. We would look directly into the eyes of their, of their women. We made some fundamental errors. And in doing that, because of the Pashtun Wali Code, whether you're a member of the Taliban or not, we helped 
recruit yes. more Taliban. Um, a fundamental member of the Taliban, Taliban means student, and it means a religious student. Mm -hmm. And if you know the history uh, of Mullah Omar, who is still officially the leader of the Taliban, he was asked to take over in Kandahar province by the religious leaders because there were members of the Mujahideen who had thrown the Russians out, or allegedly thrown the Russians out, who were behaving badly. They were, they were taxing people on roads in Kandahar. They were raping women in Kandahar. And so Mullah Omar, who is the spiritual leader and supposedly the, former, the, the man that formed the Taliban, he was an ex-Mujahideen soldier, a warrior, respected member of the community, and he killed those guys that were behaving badly. And there was a groundswell behind him of religious fervor, of going back to fundament, the fundamental laws of the Quran. And he basically, they swept all the way in and removed the government that was, was there in situ after the Russians left. So an average member of the Taliban, there, there are two generally also, there's a cliche to say there are two types. There's a $10 Taliban, is there known? Have you heard of this terminology? Oh, I do understand what you mean. Basically, you've got proper soldiers mm -hmm. that will wear body armor sometimes, they wear bandoliers, they're trained very well. They're ex-Mujahideen fighters. And you have what has become to be known by the press as the $10 Taliban. Peasant paid for? Yeah, no, an unemployed person, not even a peasant. A peasant at least lives in an area. Oh. These are transient workers, generally sometimes addicts. Mm -hmm. They can be people who would work in the, during the poppy harvest, so they'll move from oh. farm to farm, cutting the poppy, mm -hmm. or working on the wheat harvest. And they'll also, if you ask them, they'll pick up a Kalashnikov and work with somebody else to, to, to kill NATO, NATO forces or ISAF forces out there. So you've got your fundamentally highly trained, um, religiously orientated, dedicated devotee to the cause of the Taliban. And you also have, and you also have uh, mercenaries, for want of a better word. From other, other from abroad. Well, no, but some, you have people from all over, but you also have fundamentalists who have come particularly to want to kill predominantly Americans. I don't think they're looking probably for your nationality or my nationality, maybe more my nationality more than yours, but they predominantly want to kill Americans. And before Afghanistan turned into the war that it is now, which approximately was 2006, 2007, um, if you wanted to kill an American, you really had to go to Africa. You remember the bombings that had in, in Africa yeah. and the, uh, there was a suicide run. In on the embassies. Yeah, the embassies and also their ships. You could, yes. There was a suicide um, run on, on, on one of their ships. They attacked one of their ships. Mm -hmm. didn't they? But um, now, if you're a fundamentalist and you believe in, the, in jihad against the United States of America, you can go into Pakistan, you know, go across the border, and, and there are people that will recruit you and, turn, and train you into a soldier to be able to go and, um, and kill Americans, or what you perceive to be the threat, or the, the threat to Islam from the West. If we look at the, uh, the whole war uh, and consider it a, a, a timeline and we see a progress bar, how does it look to you? I mean, uh, will, will it be a success? I think it's very hard to quantify what success is because You'll never know the good that's been done. People only ever look at, well, they'll, they'll weigh out the amount of people that have been killed. They'll look at the amount of people that have been seriously hurt. Um, and they'll try and estimate or guesstimate the good that has been done there. And it's very hard to, to really work that out. I mean, the people that will have profited from this war, undoubtedly the arms dealers, yeah? Undoubtedly, the people that would have benefited the most, I have to say, are probably the people that are involved in the arms trade. Mm. And also the people that supplied water, for instance. When we first arrived in Afghanistan, a bottle of water had to travel into Karachi, which is in Pakistan, and be driven all the way up into, into Afghanistan. Now, if you're supposed to drink seven litres of water a day, mm and just say, you make it for 50 pence, you bottle it, it's a pound, and then by the time it gets up there, it's, it's seven pounds a bottle. Mm -hmm. Don't know what that is in your currency, but it's still a lot of money, right? Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, you think how much money was made out of water in the early days, it's just astronomical, isn't it? Think about fuel, think about yes. just food, to keep an army the size that was, is out there going. It's estimated by the US, uh, by the White House, in fact, that it, it costs, 
To keep one American soldier on the ground for a year, it costs a million US dollars. One soldier? One soldier. Including everything. That's I mean, everything. That's yeah. his helicopter there and his flights yes. back, his uniform, his food, his weaponry, everything. Indeed. It costs a million dollars. Now, if you think about where that country is presently, um, that's a lot of money. A lot of money anyway. Um, and if you put that into the equation of what good that has done, I would suggest that the money that was spent hasn't actually produced the results that people wanted. Now, you also have to answer the question, because I'm going around this as a politician would do. I'm not really answering the question. Um, you have to, to work out, are the Americans really going to leave in 2014? Well, at the moment, they're not really going to leave, I don't think. They say the British troops will all be out of there by 2014. I, I can't wait to see that, because I probably think that British troops will remain behind in a supervisory role. Mm -hmm. And also, the most important thing, if you want to stop the Taliban from arriving at the gates of Kabul, the only way that you will stop that is by controlling the skies. And to control the skies, you have to have aircraft there. To have aircraft there, you have to have personnel there, not only to fly those aircraft, but to maintain them. And it would appear at the moment with the increase on green on blue, you understand? Yes. I, I, I can see very much, and I hope it doesn't happen, but of all the sacrifices that have been made by, by, by personnel from your, fat, from, your, from, from, from your country and from, and from my country, I would hate for us to withdraw and for it to go back to exactly the way it was, which is a north and south divide between the Pashtuns in the south and the Azeris and the Uzbeks and the Tajiks in the north. Um, as it was before, um, you know, NATO troops went into Afghanistan. Well, I'm going to ask you a question I asked everybody there uh, who was connected with arms. Uh, I asked them, what was their favorite gun? What's your favorite gun? My favorite gun? Anyone that isn't shooting at me. It's my favorite gun. Let's talk about uh, sanitation things. Uh, Have they your, changed? Your, your, your personal... Uh, Experience, I mean, yeah, uh, well, infections. Uh, infections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, well, the biggest thing that took soldiers off the battlefield, uh, and still does, mm -hmm. um, is, 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 is DNV. We call it DNV, diarrhea and vomiting. Oh, yeah. And, and um, I don't know if you've watched the films, but, you know, when we were in Musakala, when we used to burn... You have the, burn, the oil drums where you go to the toilet. Yeah. Obviously out on the field, if you're out on the ground on a, on a patrol that lasts for a number of days, you go out where you are and you generally pretty, you know, you use the, the, the sanitation wipes or um, you can wash your hands in the stream. I wouldn't recommend that because they're generally full of effluent anyway. Um, what happened there was that there was a massive outbreak of diarrhea and vomiting and, you know, the commanding officer of, of D Company, Five Scots, mm -hmm. I think he went down to something ridiculous like seven and a half stone. That's it lost very, weight? Lost weight. He went from 12 stone. I don't know what that is in kilograms. Anybody? So he, was, he went down from about 98 to about uh, 53. Yes. Yeah, he's lost nearly half his body weight. You, you couldn't tell. You know when you've... Skeleton, you've got a grip cage. You couldn't tell which way he was looking, apart from the fact his head was looking one way. Um, Matt can work, I'm sure Matt's going to work it out for us. Um, Is he well now? Oh, yeah, he's absolutely fine. He was, never, he was never fat, trust me. He was always a bit thin, but, you know, people dropped and people were very sick. And I can remember, you know, going to the toilet, into the oil drum, mm -hmm. um, shitting into the oil drum, and being sick as I was being, it was coming out of both Simultaneously. Ends, simultaneously. Yeah, right. And because you had a red head torch on, you know, the red light filter on, yes, so you, yes. you don't get shot at night. It looked mauve between my legs, what was coming out and what was coming out of my mouth. And I can never forget a fly <laughs> lifting up out of there and landing straight in my oh. mouth. Right? But things have changed. Oh. And things have changed for the better. And in, it's an American invention. It's called the John Bag, mm -hmm. and which, um, you know, just, I just thought it was ridiculous. It was the Americans who invented this bag, and it, it works perfectly. You basically carry it in your pack, you open it up on a sliding zip, you know, a plastic zip. You open it up, 
you go to the tour, inside it, it's got your wipes your, mm. and your, your stuff to wipe your backside, your bottom, whatever you want to call it. Is your there arm. a fly inside? There's no fly inside. The fly couldn't survive because the chemicals are in that are going to eat your shit. <laughs> yeah? And also you can throw it on a burns pit. So afterwards, there is basically no evidence of, of, of you ever having been to the toilet or the fly, if there was a fly. Um, and what I found fascinating was that it's absolutely stopped DNV, diarrhea and vomiting, on the battlefield for anyone that uses these because you never have to put anything, your hands never get covered in shit, basically. Yeah. However, I go and spend time with um, the American United States Marine Corps and they refuse to use them because <laughs> for whatever reason. And consequently, they're all being sick and having diarrhea. So they, they, maybe they thought it was too girlish. That's exactly what they thought. Oh, that particular massive. company, yeah, do you know what? I'd rather be girly and not being sick and, and shitting at the same time continuously and being dehydrated and being basically, I mean, when you get it that bad, mm -hmm. you are completely, you know, you're out of it. Right. Yeah. It's like drinking five bottles of 666 or 999. <laughs> <laughs> well, um... Tell us about your agenda, if there was such a thing. I mean... There was never an agenda. The agenda was this. You always adopted to the uh, army operations. Yeah, well, what the reason for going out there originally was that I wanted to go out to Iraq and our Ministry uh, of Defence wouldn't let me. Um, and then it just so happened that in the period of time that we were making a gang series, um, the war accelerated in Afghanistan and coincidentally my family regiment, mm -hmm. which is one Royal Anglian, mm -hmm. so from the east of, of the United Kingdom, um, they were going out, my dad's old regiment. And so it was actually um, leverage or us pushing not only the MOD, mm -hmm. but also eventually getting permission from the from the, uh, that regiment. Mm -hmm. And it literally came down to the say-so of the regimental sergeant major, not even the, the colonel in mm -hmm. charge. It was actually the, the guy that's in charge of the soldiers um, directly. And they gave us a, a green light. It was a mixture, like most things, uh, you know, they don't, you can try and make things happen. Um, but a lot of the time, it's about luck, circumstance, and, and, and being lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time. And I won't, I can't reiterate this much. I am very fortunate that, for instance, I had Matt, Matt Bennett with me uh, most of the time. I had some fantastic cameramen go out on the ground, very brave men. And, you know, it's all right for me because I'm, I'm looking around like this, 360. They're looking for something like this in black and white. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everything, I generally get a lot of the praise for, for being there because I'm the one on camera. You've got to bear, the, bear in mind that there's a cameraman generally with me, sometimes a sound man with me, um, and, and, and all the other people that support you throughout doing that. They're all very, very brave, incredibly brave people. And I certainly wouldn't be walking around now if it wasn't for them. And also for the fact that, you know, I've had the protection not only of being with the British Army, but all the other forces that I've been with, and particularly the ones up there. Because if it's not for them, I would definitely not be here. I know that. In one episode, I saw you uh, telling the audience that uh, if you had uh, no choice, you had a uh, submachine gun in your hands or something like that, and you told the audience, yeah, that's true, that you would use it if you, if you must. Of course, you're, you're, you're entitled to. I don't think it's the thing that you should do as a journalist, but, or a journalist reporter, whatever you want to call it. You are, as a British citizen, that's why we were trained by the army before we left. And we have, each time we go, we get to give a little bit of a, you know, a reminder mm -hmm. um, uh, that you are, as a, foreign nation, as, a, as a British citizen in a foreign place, <laughs> if you're last man standing, mm -hmm. literally, yes. then you have the right to defend your life against somebody who's taking it, trying to take and it from you. question was, um, did, did it ever occur? Uh, so it was going to happen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did you shoot? No. No, but it got to the point once when it was very close, yeah. Okay. I've been on the ground when bayonets have been used, when people have come around the corner and been that close. Mm -hmm. People have got hurt, and that is war. And if you're going to go out and cover war, that's going to happen. I am a good marksman. 
My good mind. I think I am. Okay. All right. I, I last, of my, last of my shot I was with the Marines before we went out on the last tour and I was okay. But you know what? It's like everything. You think you're better as thing. You think you get better at things as you get older. In fact, you get worse at most things as you get older. Tell us anything nice and... Ah, ah, anything nice? Very, very, very nice about the Lithuanian army. <laughs> You, you saw the guys. Yeah, I did, yeah. And um, I was saying to you, you know, when I first went out there, I just wanted to know who that big... I didn't recognise the camouflage to begin with. I think the camouflage has changed now. But also, they were just the biggest blokes there. <laughs> and girls. Mm -hmm. Very, but, you know, um, and I know because the size of your, of, your, uh, of your country, you're doing a continuous turnover, which is, a con uh, you know, a big demand on your armed forces. And... They have my utmost respect in terms of the fact that if you look at, look at the Americans, for instance, you'll do one tour probably, and that's it. And if you're a British soldier now, you probably might do three, maybe four, if you're going to stay the whole time. You might even do once. But if you're, if you're in your army, you're on a continuous rotation. And, you know, I, I hope that the people in your country appreciate the stresses and strains that takes, not only on them, but on their families. And, you know, if you look at other countries around the world, your country has probably sacrificed more in terms of that than most. The ratio. The ratio. Now, a, a very serious question. Uh, have you made friends with some... Of course you did, but I mean... Uh, Long-term friends. Long-term yeah. friends, and, and coming back some time later, finding out that they are dead. People have died while I've been out on the battlefield, yes. Yeah, uh, if you watch the film, I mean, it, the, the hardest thing for me is, sorry, it sounds very flippant this, but it's true. The hardest thing for me is not somebody dying while you're out on the ground. It's not even knowing someone and then being killed, whether it be a blue on blue, mm -hmm. whether it be a friendly fire accident, or whether it be IED, or whether it be in a firefight. The hardest thing for me has always been, and I think the team would agree with me, is going and meeting the parents, and them asking you to tell them what really happened. Because predominantly, they won't want to believe the events that they're given by the by the army or by by, 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 by the navy, yeah, by the navy. So they, they, they really they want they believe sometimes that you're going to inform them of something that will justify the fact that that their child, who they loved, is no longer here. And when you can't give them that solace, uh, it is very upsetting. And I have cried on more than one occasion, and don't mind saying that when I've been particularly with the mothers of those young boys that have died. And you also feel incredibly guilty because they're 18. I'm 48 years old. I've had a life. I've had a great life. I'm not intending it to finish just yet, but you look at the equation of why the hell should I be standing here talking to you about the loss of your child? Why am I here and, and they're not? And so there is an element of guilt that you feel about the fact that you're alive and they're not. And that's the truth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. No further questions. It was Thank you.